name is Brandi Roberts, and I am the student body president here at West Texas A&M University. It is an honor and a privilege to welcome our friends, family, and most importantly, the students here at West Texas A&M University. Everyone in attendance of tonight's event is in for a great treat. This is only the second time in 102 years of WT history that WT has hosted a U.S. president. This evening, we will hear from former, former President Bill Clinton as he speaks about the William J. Clinton Foundation and the Clinton Global Initiative. But first, I have the great pleasure of introducing Hereford's Marine Corps Junior ROTC, who will present the colors. will follow the ROTC and she will be singing the Star Spangled Banner. Please stand and remove your hats as the Junior ROTC presents our colors.
As Brandy just informed you, I'm Dr. James Calvey, and I am chair of the Distinguished Lecture Series Committee. I want to thank you for coming this evening. I hope you will agree with me that this is a very special night in the history of West Texas A&M University. I know Dr. O'Brien regrets that he isn't able to be here, but it is largely through his leadership that we are able to bring nationally prominent speakers to the West Texas University, State University, West Texas A&M University campus. It is my distinct honor to introduce tonight's speaker. President Bill Clinton is the first Democratic president since Franklin D. Roosevelt to be elected to two full terms. As president, he prepared the first national balanced budget in 40 years. And during that period of time, the nation enjoyed almost unparalleled economic growth and prosperity. But it's not his accomplishments as president that I want to speak about tonight. I want to speak of his accomplishments since leaving the presidency. Upon leaving the White House, Mr. Clinton established the Clinton Foundation. Among the, his first projects was the Clinton HI, uh, HIV AIDS Initiative, which later became the Clinton Health Access Initiative, which combats AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. In 2005, the Clinton Foundation partnered with the American Heart Association to found the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, a program designed to combat obesity among American children. The Clinton Economic Opportunity Initiative provides opportunities for persons in disadvantaged economic communities to become entrepreneurs and to start small businesses. Three times after the 2004 tsunami and hurricanes Katrina and Ike, President Clinton cooperated with former President George H.W. Bush to raise money for recovery efforts following those disasters. More recently, at the request of President George W. Bush, the two former presidents created the, Bush, the Clinton Bush Initi Initiative for Haiti. In 2009, in recognition Thank you. In 2009, in recognition for his work, President Clinton was named a UN Special Envoy for Haiti. Last year, along with former President George W. Bush and current Speaker of the House John Boehner, President Clinton teamed up to help raise money for a memorial for the heroes of United Flight 93, which crashed near Shanksville, Pennsylvania on September 11, 2001. We are proud to be a part of that effort this evening. As you can see, his accomplishments are many, and I have a feeling he's not finished yet. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 42nd President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton. Thank you, Dr. Kelly, for the kind introduction. Thank you, Brandy Roberts, for the words that you spoke earlier, and Nick Getchett, who's going to come up afterward and ask me questions. I'm going to take a big risk and thank him in advance. <laughs> if I hate the questions, I reserve the right to withdraw. First, let me say, I was thrilled to be invited tonight for any number of reasons. I like the Texas Panhandle and I was over in El Paso earlier. I gave a speech in Las Vegas this morning and I flew down to El Paso. Then I came over here and when I was in El Paso, I was doing an event for the congressman there who's a good friend of mine 
and he's been a big supporter of the military and the veterans. Fort Bliss is one of the nation's most important army bases in El Paso. And I thought about one thing I would tell the students tonight. I got off the plane and I was greeted by the commandant of Fort Bliss, a major general by the name of Dana Tatar, a native of El Paso, an African American who was, when he was young, one of my military aides. Every couple of years, each military service, the four main ones and the Coast Guard, pick a young officer they believe has unlimited potential, and they ask him to go around with the president, travel everywhere the president goes, and carry the infamous football, which contains the machine that if you plug the right numbers in, to it, you can launch nuclear weapons. Thank God we never had to do that. But it's a very responsible position, and it gives a young person an unbelievable window on how the affairs of the nation are conducted. And there I was looking at Dana Petard, thinking about him when he was young, and I loved the guy when he worked for me. I could just tell he was going a long way. I've kept up with a lot of those people. And one reason I try to spend a fair amount of time on college campuses is to convince all of you who are students here that there are no limits to your potential. If you have imagination, if you have vision, if you're willing to work for it. I mean, this guy was an ordinary kid from El Paso and now he's a two-star general, one in one of America's most important army bases that coincidentally is in his hometown. I was the first person in my family ever to graduate from college. And when I was young, my family moved from a town of 6,000 to a metropolis of 35,000. I thought I was in Paris or something, you know. But in the first year, we didn't really have a place to live, and my mother was a nurse and ethicist, and my dad was going to work in a Buick dealership with his brother, my uncle, and my uncle had a farm out in the country, and so he'd ask us if we'd live on the farm for a while and take care of the farm. Now, I am so old. I was seven at the time. I lived on a farm in the state adjoining this one that still had goats and sheep. <laughs> I fed them and did first one thing and another. And we had a ram on that farm that was the meanest, hardest-headed animal I ever saw in my life. And one day at seven, I took my nine-year-old cousin out into the field where the sheep were to see the ram, and he started chasing us. And we started running for the fence. And the bot, there were these, we didn't tend to feel very well. It was full of very big rocks. And I was short and fat and tripped over a rock. <laughs> and here comes the ram. And like a fool, what I should have done is just kept running for the fence. And if he knocked me down, got up and run for the fence again. Like a fool, I ran back to the nearest tree, which I thought I could run around and outrun the ram. But the problem is the tree was only about this big around. <laughs> And that sucker caught me and headbutted me right in the middle of my skull. And then he'd back up and he, he was very symmetrical, this ram. He'd back up a few steps and then he'd run and he'd butt me in the gut. Then he'd back up and he'd butt me in the head. And then he did this 23 times. It's a miracle I was here. It's no wonder so many people thought I was crazy. So anyway, I was bleeding profusely around that, and my uncle came down, who was, yeah, it was his daughter that was with me, and he picked one of these huge rocks up and threw it as hard as he could at the ram from about six feet, and he hit the ram square in the middle of the skull, and the ram just shrugged his shoulders and ambled off. <laughs> didn't walk off, didn't squeal, didn't whine, didn't anything. That's when I decided I needed to do something for a living besides farming. If I had known 
that one day we'd have $7 wheat, $7 corn, and $15 soybeans, I might have had a different opinion. <laughs> but at the time, it seemed like a good idea to get out of Dodge, and so I did. I want to begin by thanking the university for inviting me here and offering to donate $100,000 to the fund to complete the memorial in Shanksville, Pennsylvania for Flight 93. You'd all kind of identify with Shanksville. Pennsylvania has been described as Philadelphia in the east, Pittsburgh in the west, and Alabama in between. It's rural, it's agricultural, and it's full of good people. I love it, and I've been to every hole in the road in the state, I think. But what happened there is something everyone from Texas can identify with. Texas' old character and self-image has been shaped by the almost mythic proportions that the story of the Alamo has attained here. In truth, the battle for Texas independence and all that later happened, including Texas becoming the Lone Star State, was shaped not by a military victory at San Jacinto, but by the defeat at the Alamo because those 238 brave souls held out so long and cost the Mexican army so much in casualties and in ammunition that by the time they did overrun the Alamo and kill everybody there, Texas had organized an army under Sam Houston that could defeat them. And it was one of those relatively rare examples in human history when the people that gave you the state that you now treasure made a deliberate collective decision to give their lives for a larger objective. Everybody that goes into battle risks their lives, but they knew in advance that they were going to perish. The first such example in human history that I cited when President Bush and I were with Speaker Boehner in Shanksville for the 10th anniversary involves the now famous story of the Spartans at Thermopylae, which was immortalized in the recent kind of high-tech movie, The 300. But the Greek king, Leonidas, picked his 300 finest soldiers, and he said, the Persians are coming. Their numbers are staggering. We cannot defeat them. But if we stand in the past at Thermopylae, they will have a hard time getting by us, even though we are only 300. But you have to know we will not survive. And to the man, they all went. And the Persian king gave Leonidas and the 300, he was so impressed, he gave them a chance to withdraw. And he said, you know we will devour you. We will fill the air with so many arrows. The sky will turn dark. And Leonidas replied, then we will fight under the clouds. And they did. And the battle was so protected, and the casualties on the Persian side were so heavy, that by the time they had killed the 300, the Greek people had moved and survived. The difference in Shanksville is you all probably remember what was going to happen. That was the third plane. And it was supposed to there had been the two planes, the fourth plane actually, there had been the two planes that had gone into the World Trade Center, Twin Towers, the attack on the Pentagon. This plane was supposed to hit the United States Capitol. The lifeblood of our democracy, the symbol of our freedom and our history. The difference is the people on Flight 93 were just ordinary men and women. They didn't sign on for battle. They didn't know in advance that on that day it might be their last day. And they had to decide in an instant whether they were going to derail that plane, 
knowing that the chances were more than 90% it would crash and they would all be killed, and they did. And to their everlasting credit, they fought for their lives until the end. It was only when the flame got down to 500 feet high and was coming over a little rise into the field where it struck that it flipped over and they couldn't flip it back. But unique in all the annals of American history, these people, ordinary people, who didn't sign on, made the same decisions as the Texans at the Alamo and the Greeks at Thermopylae. But they weren't professional soldiers and they didn't have any time to think about it. They instinctively knew this was what they had to do. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's worth a national memorial. People should remember that in 2,500 years, the same way we remember And so when President Bush and I were there with John Boehner, it was all we could do to get through it, looking at all the families there. I leaned over to George Bush and I said, how are you doing? He said, I was doing just great until I looked at them, all their loved ones, talking about it. And when I found out that we still had $10 million to raise to finish that, I asked John Boehner, I said, John, everybody's fighting in Washington, people are sick of it. Why don't we just go there and do a big fundraiser together? And President Bush overheard us and he said, count me in, I'll do it. So on May the 15th, the three of us are going to host this event in Washington to try to raise the rest of this money. The $100,000 we got from West Texas A&M has just been matched for the National Park Foundation. So you really raised $200,000. And that's a great thing. And it will help us to squeeze a little more out of those people in Washington who can afford it to help us finish this. So thank you. Now, I also know that President Bush and I do these Mutt and Jeff speeches sometimes. You know, they ask us both questions. He says X, I say Y, we argue a little bit and have a little fun. But uh, he told me, he said, well, you're going to Canyon, aren't you? I said, yeah. He said, so am I. He said, but I'm going to say three days from out of Basha. He said, you man enough to try to make the trip? <laughs> and I said, well, we were about a month apart in age. He loves to write me about this. I said, first of all, you never had a quadruple bypass. And secondly, thankfully, I have an excuse. <laughs> but this Wounded Warrior Project he's coming here to support is a very big deal. It's a very good thing. We have... Before my wife became Secretary of State, she was on the Armed Services Committee of the Senate and became incredibly concerned about the very high number of people who served in Iran and Iraq and because they were exposed to roadside bombs and because battlefield medicine is so much finer than it used to be, the survival rate is much higher than it once was. But that means so are the number of serious injuries. So this is a big deal. There are people all over America working like crazy, trying to help men and women who served our country recover from everything, from post-traumatic stress syndrome to amputation to serious burns to brain injuries, and it'll help. So I'm glad you're hosting that. Now here's what I want to say. We've got to figure out how to live and act as clearly when there is no emergency to tug at our heartstrings as we do when there is. I like universities because you're trained to think here, to weigh the evidence, to organize arguments, and to respect disagreement. The most interesting thing to me today is what I think of as a disconnect 
between what works in America in real life and what works in America in politics. For example, in politics, what works is division and argument. The government would mess up a two-car parade. The government has to get us out of the recession. Truth is somewhere in between. All this was caused by Republican economic policy. All this is caused because the Democrats never spent a better spending program they didn't like. I mean, it makes for great television. You know, you turn on these, these uh, network talk shows, whether they're right or left, and it's like watching mud wrestling. <laughs> I mean, it's highly entertaining. My 92-year-old mother-in-law who just passed away and who lived in our home in Washington, so my wife never came home to an empty house until her mother-in-law died, even during the week. She was an incredible woman, and she was a pretty progressive Democrat. Her husband was a Goldwater Republican, and she spent more than half her time watching Fox TV just so she could keep her circulation running. <laughs> but it was... But it was healthy because she didn't have somebody shoveling out what she thought all the time, and she had to actually think every single day about whether she really believed something and how she was going to engage in an argument. And the point I want to make is that what works in politics is not the way we conduct real life. What works in real life is when we have networks of cooperation with people who know different things, have different skills, look at problems in different ways. If you look at the prosperity centers in America, San Diego, highest percentage of Nobel Prize winning scientists anywhere in America, any city. The Human Genome Research Center of America. Why? You have government research going in there. You have a private foundation run by Craig Venters, who the scientist who pioneered the private development of the genome. You have all these companies investing there because they think biotechnology will be the main source of our new high-income jobs starting about 10 years from now. Qualcomm, the great computer company, is headquartered there, and there are now 700 other computer companies there because you can't see a genome. So the only way you can analyze all these complex formulae to find out what we already know, for example, which is what makes young girls be at higher risk of breast cancer than others if they have a variation in their human genome, that requires computers. And so it's this atmosphere of creative cooperation. And the University of California at San Diego and San Diego State and a couple of other private schools are there, and they feed students into the job market and constantly change the education programs to do it. And San Diego now has a Republican mayor, and they voted for me a couple of times. In other words, they go both ways. They are guilty of thinking. <laughs> but they, uh, why am I saying this? You know how many applications there were to the University of California in San Diego this year for the freshman class? 60,000. Putting them with the hardest universities in the world to get into is a percentage of the number of of acceptances for application. Why? Because people see the future there and they like it. And they realize we do not have to have a constant recession. We do not have to have people stuck in stagnant wages. We do not have to have a jobless economic recovery. Silicon Valley's back for the same reason. Let's move closer to home. Orlando has 100 computer simulation companies. 100, all the way from humongous defense contractors to tiny startups. Why? 
because the Defense Department and NASA put $5 million a year in research there because it's a lot cheaper and a lot safer to teach soldiers to fly jet airplanes and drive tanks and to teach would-be space cadets to fly spaceships on simulators than on the real deal. But they get a lot of help from Disney World and the Universal Theme Park and the video game division of Global Entertainment Arts. They put a huge amount of money in it. Why? Because if you go to those places like Disney World or Universal Park, it's a lot more interesting going through them if they have good computer simulation, right? And video games, all of you who've ever been stuck on one like me realize that in order to keep us in a state of constant attention deficit disorder, they have their, you've got to have really good computer simulation. So they got 100 companies there. The University of Central Florida is the largest totally unknown university in America. They have 53,000 students, and every semester they change the educational program to train people for the jobs that are opening there. They don't know we've been through a terrible recession. And it's not all high-tech stuff. The Cleveland Clinic, one of the great health institutions in America, and one of our old so-called dying industrial cities, is working with the local community college to train people for jobs they know will grow in health care because of the retirement of the baby boomers and the growth of preventive care, even among the very young. And they've gone after the toughest nut to crack in the American economy, non-college educated, middle-aged people who have a hard time finding new jobs. And they are training them relentlessly for jobs they know are going to be there. Now, what's the point of all this? If you go to one of these places and you watch them making decisions and you hear them making arguments and discussing, nine times out of ten, you won't know who's a Republican and who's a Democrat. They just said, here's a problem, let's figure out how to solve it, let's get the show on the road. And I know it's easier to say when you're not in politics anymore. And I know America's always been a partisan place. You think it's rough now, you ought to see what the supporters of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson said about each other in 1800. I think the media is partisan now, back when only white male property owners could vote and not everybody could read. Every single newspaper was a partisan newspaper, and there was no difference in the news story and the editorial page in any of them. Everybody slanted the news. So if you want to have any clue about what was going on, you had to at least read one of each and figure out how to split the difference. The very essence of democracy is disagreement. The problem is there has to come a point where you take what you can learn from the other person and you say, the time has come when we have to do something and we've got to get the show on the road. Let's do this and find something new to argue about. There will always be something to argue about. And, what I tell everybody is that there is nobody alive on planet Earth who's always right. Nobody who's perfect. Every religious faith says that we are all limited in knowledge and wisdom and reasoning capacity. Okay, so that's one extreme. On the other extreme, even a broken clock is right twice a day. Every single day. Right? So 100% of us are fated to spend our whole lives between those two extremes. Almost every one of us is going to be right more than twice a day. And nobody's going to be right 100% of the time. So we should fight for what we believe in. But we shouldn't ever demonize people who disagree with us. Instead, we ought to look for ways to work things out. You know, I... I have become... I was from the 1980s until we ran against each other, always pretty good friends with and always a big admirer of the first president. 
The second President Bush didn't like me worth a flip because I beat his dad. I didn't blame him. I didn't. And I told him that once. I said, you don't like me, and I don't blame you because you love your father. I said, believe it or not, I do too. I just didn't agree with what he was doing in 1992, and nobody else would show up and take the fight, and I thought we should. But I told him, I said, now you're president. If I can ever do anything to help you, that I can do a good conscience, I will do it. And if you never want me to say a word about it, I won't. There's an interesting article in Time Magazine this week about former presidents and how they treated each other in office and later. And um, anyway, things happened. And we got closer and closer. And by the end of his last three years he's in office, we talked at least twice a year for often 45 or 50 minutes about everything under the sun. And now we work in Haiti together. President Obama asked us to raise some money for Haiti. And we decided we would set up a fund to try to build a free enterprise system here. They had no mortgage system, they had no small business loan system, they had all kinds of problems where the average entrepreneur, and there are a lot of them down here, never had a fighting chance. And so we found something we agreed on and we did it. We've had a great time doing it. We still disagree on a lot. But the point is, it works because it's dynamic. It's not a static Mexican standoff where you feel like you've got to buy your, bring your six-shooter and just fire all your bullets. It's about creative disagreement to get to a positive conclusion. Now, let me tell you why I think that. I'll just use agriculture since I'm here. And I noticed this, and since I made a mess of my early life as a farmer, when I got to Washington, I was absolutely shocked at how little anybody knew about farming and how few people in the Congress in either party knew anything about how, what the macroeconomics of agriculture were or what the microeconomics were of bringing in a crop. They just didn't know anything. And I remember once we were, I was submitting this budget in 1993 that had these really tough budget cuts, and one of the things we were going to do is cut the farm support some. And some of these city people were, that worked for me, and I loved them, and they were real smart, but they were almost gleeful. They acted like this was the easiest thing that we had to do. And I said, let me tell you something. Tonight, when you go home and eat, look at the dinner and ask yourself if you got a clue how it got there. And I said, I represent, my, my home state grows 40% of America's rice crop. We have a lot of soybeans, we have a lot of wheat. We have a decent corn crop in the years when prices are astronomical like they have been. And I said, this is something we got to do. The farmers know we got to do it. They'll pay their fair share if they think it's fair. But you don't have to enjoy this. You don't have to enjoy making life more difficult for anybody. And you got to understand it. You know, when I was born right after World War II, we still have about 20% of America living on farms. And now it's down to 1%. So it's not surprising that we don't understand it. But it's really, really important. I am delighted that our trade policies and our investment policies and our agricultural research system have led us to such dominance that with the world having 7 million people and rising demand for food, that corn nearly $7, wheat's a little over $7, and soybeans are nearly $15. But it's not an accident. And it's nothing to be sneezed at. I also worked hard when I was president because I believe the average farmer is a pretty good environmentalist by nature. And we just gave more incentives for the conservation reserve so we could keep the soil from playing out. When they didn't do that in the north of China, they created a constant dust storm, which is one of the reasons Beijing is so polluted all the time, because local pollution catches all the dust coming down from the north. If you don't take care of the land, it comes back to bite you. But the point 
I'm trying to make is that that wasn't a partisan liberal conservative deal. That was a people who knew and people who didn't know problem. And now that's become very important in America for two reasons. We want to keep producing food. We need to help more poor places in the world produce more food because even we and our Canadian friends and our friends in Europe cannot possibly meet the future needs of the Chinese, the Indians, all the other countries that are growing fast and getting richer. So we have a vested interest in helping other people, particularly poor countries, to do that. I work in a lot of African countries with farmers and some Latin American countries, and the worst we have done, just modernizing feed and seed, basic farm to market, transportation costs, and storage, the worst we've done anywhere is to double farm income. Sometimes we increase farm income four or five times what they were making before. Because they don't have the systems that we've taken for granted in America for years. So that's the setup for the main point I want to make before we go to the questions. We're living in a pretty great world that got you into this university hall tonight. Most of us have had pretty good lives. There's a different story for every person there is here, and some of you have had to come much more, overcome much more adversity than others. But it's well to remember something the sagest Texan I ever knew about politics, Bob Strauss, who's still alive and well at 93, once told me, he said, every politician in America wants you to believe they were born in a log cabin they built themselves. <laughs> he, said, he said, but it ain't so. Somebody helped every one of us to get to these chairs. There was a teacher, there was a parent, there was a guy that gave us the first job in the summer. There was somebody who helped us all along the way. And this is happening because of systems we all take for granted. You'd be shocked if the lights went out, the screen went dark, the microphone failed, the air conditioning went on the blink and all my hot air made you uncomfortable. <laughs> like you'd just be shocked. If you get bored with what I'm saying, you can excuse yourself and go to the restroom. You can stop and get a cream glass of water. I spent a lot of my life in places where people can't take any of that for granted. When we just had the inauguration of the new president of Haiti, a country where 70% of the people were living less than $2 a day, living on less than $2 a day, before the earthquake. The whole sound system went out in the middle of his inaugural address, which was an impassioned plea to finally modernize the country through education, employment, and getting all those people from the earthquake out of those tents into good houses. So the world has a lot of challenges. It's very unequal, and that limits how much free enterprise can grow. Markets can only stretch to where there are suppliers or consumers. So it isn't good for anybody that half the world's people live on $2 a day. A billion people live on $1 a day. A billion people go to bed hungry tonight. A billion people never get a clean glass of water. Two and a half billion people have no access to sanitation. 100 million kids, give or take, never go to school, and at least that many go to school in name only because they don't have trained teachers or learning materials. So it's in our interest to create a world there where there's more shared prosperity and shared responsibilities because that makes your education and your endeavors worth more, not less. You should not begrudge another country's rise or feel threatened by it. You should see it as an opportunity to create a world of more shared prosperity. And the same thing is true in America. With all this discussion today about what caused all this income inequality, 
and it's kind of complicated, but I have, I hope I have a little credibility on it because in my eight years, at least the bottom 20% and the top 20% of earners both increase their incomes by the same amount in percentage terms. And median family income would be an all-time high. But, as in every time you change the paradigm, you have a lot of fabulous wealth. I mean, Bill Gates got as rich as he did because he knew something we didn't and figured out how to make the most of it, but it helped everybody else. Steve Jobs, who was a friend of mine who just passed away, same story. So, we never resent success. What happened was when we reached a stall in the first decade of this century and all of our growth was coming from home building and consumer spending, which was a fancy way of saying people were maxing out their credit cards, and finance, which is a fancy way of saying rich people didn't invest in new businesses so much because they didn't find many opportunities, so they were investing things like home mortgage securities and upping the leverage in the real estate market. Yeah, the top 1% got more. And I personally believe as part of a long-term debt reduction plan, we should go back, I love saying this because I'm in that income group now, and I didn't have two nickels to rub together after I left the White House. I was the lowest paid governor in America for a decade. And the people of Arkansas thought I was getting too much. <laughs> but I don't have any problem with that, but you could tax my income group at 100%, and if you didn't have any economic growth, and you didn't have any plan to rein in long-term entitlement spending, we still couldn't balance the budget, and we couldn't grow the economy. So, what I see is this. We have a lot of inequality, there's a lot of instability. Look how fast the financial system spread. Look how vulnerable we are to what's going on in Europe. I personally think we also are on an unsustainable development track because of the way we produce and consume energy and local resources cannot be sustained. Climate change, I believe, is real and unavoidable. And last year, an event occurred which I was literally shocked, got almost no publicity. Because for several years now, Roughly 95% of the climate scientists have said global warming is real and it's not sustainable. Bad things are going to happen. The ice caps are melting too fast. The sea water is rising too fast. We've got to change the way we produce and consume energy. <coughs> and for 15 years, I've been saying this is the best way to create a new economy and create new jobs if you do it in a smart way. But there have always been people who said that's just a bunch of bull, people who felt that Texas oil and West Virginia coal and everything else was threatened if this happened. And a lot of money has been put in to intimidating the people who believe in global warming so that the press would say, well, of course some people say this and some people say that. Yeah, 95% of the people said it was real, 5% of the people said it wasn't, and they write the stories as if it's a 50-50 deal. But last year an astonishing thing happened. Of all the people who were skeptical of climate change in America, the most highly respected scholar was a physicist named Richard Muller at the University of California. Universally regarded as a world-class physicist, universally regarded as a serious and honest scientist, he had a very practical objection to all the scientific studies saying climate change is real. And I have personal experience with him. He said, I think they're taking too many of these climate measurements too close to cities. And cities are hotter than rural areas. And that's true. I live in a little town, in a 115-year-old farmhouse. I live in a little town about 30 miles north of New York City. There are countless mornings in the last 10 years when I got in the car to go down to New York to go to work. When I got out of the car at work, it was 10 degrees warmer than it was when I left. We've all experienced this. So Mueller got a bunch of money from people who wanted climate change to be a fraud, 
to do a study. Last year, he appeared before a committee of the House of Representatives chaired by a Texan, Ralph Hall. And he said, okay, I did it. I did 1.3 billion temperature measurements. And I corrected for all these biases I thought these other guys made. And I just finished looking at all the information. And I'm sort of sorry to tell you, they were right and I was wrong. The world is warming at an unsustainable rate. People are causing it. And we can argue whether there's a more conservative or a more liberal option to do something about it. But we better do something about it or we're going to have serious problems. And so I say that because if we had the right debate, we'd be thinking about that. And it's fascinating. You look at Virginia. is a they voted for President Obama in 2010, but they've been voted pretty much conservative Republican since then. And they've been reversing a lot of their incentives to develop a clean energy economy. But mayors, including Republican mayors, that govern cities on the coast of Virginia are drawing up plans right now for a rising sea level in the Atlantic to figure out how to avoid having their cities washed away when it rises up. I've always thought the best thing, I tell him this every third time I see him, I've always thought the best thing Governor Bush did when he was governor was to take advantage of the fact that there's a lot of wind in Texas to make you the number one producer of electricity for wind in the country. And, interesting, Iowa, which also has a Republican governor and a Republican legislature, is second in the country. And, but on a good day in Texas, if the wind's really blowing where the windmills are, you can get up to 25% of your electricity from the wind. And the thing about it is twofold. Number one, it's free once you pay for the windmill. And number two, it's clean. Oh, and there is that little matter of the third. For every billion dollars you spend, on a coal-fired plant, you get 870 jobs. For every billion dollars you spend on wind energy, if the windmills and the blades are made in America, you get 3,300 jobs. So, when I flew down here tonight, and it was still daylight, I was looking for the windmills. And I, I say that because this is a practical issue. This shouldn't be an ideological war between the two parties. President Bush's Energy Department, not President Obama's, President Bush's Energy Department, says that enough wind blows in North Dakota in 2005 to electrify 25% of America. And that enough wind blows from the Canadian border with North Dakota to the South Texas and West Texas border with Mexico to electrify America many times over. And there's just one problem with that. Even in Texas, you see it. Except for the sunshine in Southern California, in Arizona, in the Las Vegas area, by and large, in America, the sun shines brightest and the wind blows hardest where the people are not. Right? So, I'll never forget when I was trying to help Hillary in 2008, I gave a talk in May in Del Rio and Eagle Pass in El Paso on the last night, and I was standing on the back of a pickup truck in Del Rio and Eagle Pass, and I nearly got blown off. <laughs> and so I had the guy go check the wind meter. The wind was blowing 46 miles an hour in both places. And unlike here, there wasn't a windmill in sight. Why? On the last on night, and I was standing on the back of a pickup truck in Del Rio and Eagle Pass, and I nearly got blown off. And so I had the guy go check the wind meter. The wind was blowing 46 miles an hour in both places. And 
that the unlike here, there, there wasn't there, no windmill there, inside. Like, Why? Because all the places so are so small and, and the transmission is so limited that if you set up the windmills, you couldn't send it back to Houston or wherever else you want it. So, it's an interesting question. Should we build a national electrical grid so we can take advantage of all this and be more energy independent or not? That would grow the economy. The point is, if we spend all of our time having an ideological fight about whether it's a problem or not, then we waste a lot of energy where we could figure out who's got the best idea to make the most money, start the most new businesses, create the most jobs, help the most farmers. There's plenty of countries in Europe where the farmers own all the windmills and they sell the power to the utilities. And it's helped supplement farm income in a way that is maintain the structure of family farms to an extent that we really want, I think, in America to do wherever we can for the next 20 or 30 years. But we're not having the right debate. Why? Because we're talking about whether to do something instead of how to do it. And I spend, so, this is the setup to say this. If you're working in a poor country, like Haiti or the African countries I work in or the poorer parts of Latin America and East Asia, what they need are the systems that got you in these chairs tonight. You have to build education and health and finance systems and clean, open government systems and energy systems. We just finished building with my partner in Haiti, Paul Farmer, a huge new teaching hospital outside Port of Prince. It's going to have 1,800 solar cells and generate so much power that it'll take care of the hospital and feed into the grid and provide electricity at lower prices to poor people who are working. And why should you care about that? Because the Caribbean, are, they're our neighbors. They could be great customers for our products, but they have the highest electric rates in the world, including two places in the Caribbean, the American Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico that are part of the United States. And the reason they have the highest electric rates is, unlike Texas, they don't have any oil and gas. Trinidad has some, nobody else has any. So they import all of their base fuel for electricity in diesel or heavy oil. They pay through the nose for it. Then they charge monopoly prices for it. And so in Haiti, I already told you how poor it is, they pay 36 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity. I'll bet you anything up here you pay somewhere between five and eight. So it's an opportunity for us to make money. We've got all this technology. But what you have to do when you're working with poor places is help them build systems. If you've got a rich place, the US, Europe, and Japan, that have been rich a long time, we have systems that made us great, but they always get long in the tooth, and you have to reform them. And we shouldn't be upset about that. Nothing works forever the way it was set up. So in America, we have to be willing to reform our basic energy, education, health care, federal budget, long-term retirement, budget, finance systems. And they're all complicated, and they require changes in the public as well as the private sector. And you can't get to change a complicated system in a way that works better if you spend all your time fighting about whether you're going to do it. And everybody acts like they're over here closer to being perfectly right all the time and closer to being the broken clock. So let me just give you a couple of examples. If you look at America's strengths, we talk about Europe or Japan. I think, by the way, don't write off Japan. They'll find a way to come back. But they have some big problems that nobody talks about. What are the strengths of the United States? We're the youngest, long-time rich country in terms of our workforce. We're much younger than Europe and Japan. 
Only Ireland has a workforce younger than America's. And having lost it, I can tell you that youth is very important. <laughs> when it comes to workforce, demographics is destiny. It shapes what you can do. Secondly, we're, the mo we're much more diverse than those countries. We have people in America from everywhere else. And since we will be doing more and more business with other people, other places, not just in agriculture, but in all kinds of technology and biotechnology and other things, that's a great, priceless advantage. Thirdly, it's still easier to start a small business here than it is in most places. And if we get this home mortgage thing resolved quicker, we get back to more small business lending, and you'd see this country growing a lot faster. So that's a big strength. Fourthly, we have the best university network in the world still. And you're part of it. You should be proud of it. The best research, the best development. Fifth, there are going to be 9 million people on Earth by 2050, and we're still better at growing and distributing food than anybody else. And finally, we have these prosperity centers I mentioned, which show us how to create a modern economy that works for everybody. So those are our strengths. So what are our challenges? First, our infrastructure is not very good. Our roads and bridges and water and sewer systems are all getting long in the tooth. The Transportation Council says it costs us over $100 billion a year just to wait in traffic jams. That we spend a fortune every year fixing flats and broken axles because of potholes. More than we would in other courses. Even more important for you young people, We've fallen to 16th in the world in computer download speeds. South Korea is now number one, and their download speeds are four times faster than ours. And that's something we can fix without much money, but that matters to our future economic growth and prospects and how many people we can get to come create new internet-related businesses. And education, we solved about every problem, but we're not very good at replicating excellence, so we're still not doing very well in overall competitive tests, K through 12. And the problem we got in higher education is that the prices have gone up so much and incomes have been flat that in the last dozen years we've fallen from first. Actually, it started like at the end of my term, second term. We've fallen from first to 15th in the world, and the percentage of our young adults with four-year college degrees. Now, before everybody gets in a panic here, part of that is because other people figured out what we were doing worked. And it's easier for a smaller, more coherent country to get a higher percentage of their kids into and out of university on time. So we don't have to be first. But we got no business being 15th either. And you know as well as I do that a lot of people, a lot of people dropped out because they couldn't afford it or they thought they'd never be able to pay their loans back. And one of the things I like about the new student loan reform, which will be fully implemented, I think, by 2014, is that then everybody that depends on a student loan to get through college will be able to pay that loan back as a small fixed percentage of their income for up to 20 years so that nobody, nobody will ever have to drop out of college again because of the size of their loan. Now, and I know what some of you are thinking. My mother told me if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. But I did this when I was president. I gave every college in America the option of taking a loan directly from the federal government to loan money to students who qualified for student loan. And we set aside a very substantial reserve to cover losses. Just on a volunteer basis, the students saved $9 billion on lower interest costs, and the taxpayers saved $4 billion because when young people could pay back their loans, they did. 
There was almost a zero default rate once people knew they could pay their loans back. But we got to do something about it. The health care thing, you know, there's this huge debate over health care. I'll just tell you what bothers me about the debate. People like or don't like the individual mandate or whatever. First of all, we don't talk enough about where we are. Where we are, and this relates to agriculture too, where we are is we spend 17.4% of our income on health care. No other big country spends more than 1108 That means if we had the same health care system as Germany or France or you name it, any other country, we would cover 100% of our people instead of 84%. We get better health outcomes, and we would save between $850 billion and $1 trillion a year. Now, I spent years studying where this is, but this is not all. The, the big money, 70% of the difference, is in the complex system of private insurance we have, which adds about $200 billion a year to the paperwork cost. We spent about 11 cents on the dollar more on administrative costs to process claims and pay them or not than we would if we had any other country system. And that was the argument for people who say we ought to have Medicare for all or Medicaid for all like the Canadians do. You have very low government overhead and lower overhead on the part of the health care provider. There are other problems with the Canadian system which we could talk about. But the point is, we spend $200 billion more than we would if we had any of these other systems. It's so complicated. And because we pay for procedures instead of paying for health care, we pay people to keep us healthy and then take care of us if we get sick. Instead, we just pay a little along. We spend about $450, $500 billion more a year than we would if we paid, if we were all enrolled in health plans. I could give you lots of examples of where they exist in America. But we have to fess up, we Americans, that we spend $150 billion a year more because our rates of diabetes are too high, because we have the highest rates of childhood obesity of any wealthy country, and because our older people are living longer, but they haven't taken the best care of themselves. So as citizens, we have to do something about this rising tide of obesity among young people. I work for the American Heart Association. You heard about that in the introduction. And I just didn't believe that the food companies wanted all these kids developing diabetes. But two years ago, the American Medical Association said, you got to quit calling type 2 diabetes adult onset diabetes. We have too many preteens with diabetes. Nine-year-old kid that goes to school less than a mile from my office in New York two years ago was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. So we set about trying to change that. We work, my foundation works in 14,000 schools to help the students, the teachers, the staff, and the parents eat better, exercise more, change the whole food delivery system. We cut a deal with 13 food service providers because more and more schools can't afford to provide food prepared on site. To raise the food nutritional value and cut the inputs that basically to convert into too much sugar in your body and make you likely to become diabetic. And most important, it's a big deal out here, we got all the providers to agree to deliver the new meals to rural schools at the same unit cost they delivered them in urban schools, which was a big deal because it cost more to transport them. Then we found out a lot of kids get 50 to 6% of their daily calories from soft drinks consumed in schools or full or sugary fruit juice drinks or full fat milk or anything else. They get 50 to 6% of their calories. So we went to Coca Cola, PepsiCo, Cadbury, Swebs, and the bigger drink providers. And we made a simple proposition. 
I told them, I said, this is like what we did with AIDS drugs. I said, I don't want anybody to lose money. If you lose money, I'll renegotiate this deal. Because it's not practical if you can't find a way to make a living at it. But you want all these school kids to be your customers in middle age? Or do you want them to have their legs amputated and be blind and not be able to work and live on the government dole? Because you sold so much to them when they were kids that wasn't good for them. I said, you don't intend to do this. There is no demon here. How we got to this part is a function of the dynamics of family change, the dynamics of workplace change, what happened to family income. There is no demon here, but the consequences are terrible. So here's what they agreed to do. They agreed to stop serving full sugar soft drinks. They agreed to smaller serving sizes for juice. They agreed to start serving low-fat milk. They agreed to serve more fruit-flavored waters. And in these schools, which have adhered to these guidelines all over America, which is about 90% of all of our schools, there has been an 88% reduction in the total volume of calories served to our kids in drinks in the cafeteria and in the vending machines in only four years. Totally voluntary. And I have no idea whether the people I'm dealing with were Republicans or Democrats. And I told them, so if you lose money, come back, we'll cut a new deal. So we have to change. The country desperately needs a long-term debt reduction plan. I like the simpson both plan. I think it's balanced and good. But I also think it's important to remember in the opening paragraph, Simpson, formerly the Republican whip for the Senate, a senator from Wyoming and the funniest man in American politics when he was there, and Erskine Bowles, formerly my chief of staff, head of the Small Business Administration, president of the University of North Carolina, and one of the most successful venture capitalists in the South in the last 50 years. Both said, don't start this till we got growth. Otherwise, we'll be just like the Europeans. If you put the austerity hammer down when there's no private growth, you will cut spending. Revenues will drop even more than spending is cut, which is exactly what's happening in Europe. So I like that. But it'd be good if we could still adopt a plan and say we're going to start. We'll put it in the law now so we can't weasel out of it. Put it in the law now and say it triggers when growth reaches a certain X amount. Anyway, that's the point I want to leave you with. We're a rich country. We've had a great life. We got huge assets here. Don't let people tell you America's best days are behind them. Every single challenge we have is fixable, but requires reform. But it's fixable. <laughs> fixable. The rising countries, China, India, and Brazil, God bless them all, I want them to do well, they got big challenges that they have to deal with, and I'm trying to help them with some of them. But what will work everywhere is creative networks of cooperation. We need our people who are more conservative. We need our people who are more liberal. We need people who bring a government perspective. We need people who bring a private sector perspective. And increasingly, we need people who work in organizations like the Gates Foundation or my foundation because we have, we're entrepreneurial, but unlike businesses, we don't have to turn a profit every quarter. And unlike government, we don't have to be afraid to make a mistake and to admit it when we make it. So we try to help people do things faster, cheaper, better. And that's sort of the American way. You just keep pushing rocks up a hill, trying to find out how to do things faster, cheaper, better, and one day a new day dawns. All of a sudden, everybody wonders why we weren't doing it all along. But to the young people here, I would just say this to you. I'd give anything. I'd give up being present to be your age again. I'd take my chances on being able to do it again. This is the most exciting time, all this scientific stuff, all these physics discoveries. Some guy in Switzerland says they sent a subatomic neutrino to a magnet of the Italian alphabet at the speed of light. 
which Einstein said couldn't be done. Looks like the machine made a mistake. But, but the point is, it's exciting. A lot of good stuff going on. You know what we know from the human genome? We know that unless your family is 100% descendant from Sub-Saharan Africa, it's where people first stood up on the savannah in East Africa about 150 to 200,000 years ago. Everybody else on Earth, including almost every African American, has between one and four of their genome inherited from the Neanderthals. Because, except in Sub-Saharan Africa, humans and Neanderthals shared the Earth for about 40,000 years, and turns out we liked each other even better than we knew. <laughs> now, when this great finding came out, I don't know about the rest of you, but my wife and daughter were not at all surprised to learn I was part Neanderthal. <laughs> they were, however, shocked to learn that they were, too. Now, we're laughing, but you know what else the human genome showed us? That if you look around this room tonight, we've got a pretty diverse crowd here. Every single non-age-related difference that you see, your gender, your hair color, your eye color, your height, your body shape, everything you see is lodged in only one half of one percent of your genome. We are all, all living human beings are 99.5% the same. And so I want to leave you to ponder that. Because we all, and I'm not talking about politics now, I'm talking about life. We all spend 99.5% of our time thinking about the 5.5% of us that's different, don't we? Oh, I wish my hair weren't so gray. I wish I were a little taller. I was in Kentucky yesterday, and I got to go visit with the national championship basketball team. And I saw that guy, Anthony Davis, who was the player of the year. Two years ago, he was my height. <laughs> in two years, he grows eight inches, and he still looks like a ballerina out there blocking the ball. And I thought, looks like more than half a percent of my genome to me. <laughs> I want you to laugh about it, but go home and think about it. Think about what kind of world we could build if we just spent 10% of our time thinking about the 99.5% of us that we share in common with all other living people. We have got to figure out a way to share the future because we cannot escape each other. And someday I hope you'll get to go to Shanksville when we finish that memorial. And I hope you'll remember this night. And I hope you'll remember that you did it. And I hope you will think about the unimaginable courage it took for ordinary citizens, ordinary men and women, collectively in an incident, instance, to decide to give their lives so that you could enjoy this. And then, I hope that you will feel as I do that all they would ever ask of us for their supreme sacrifice is that we do the most we can with the lives that we have. Thank you and God bless you. two questions, so please pay attention. Um, we received over 200 questions from the WT students and community, and we've narrowed them down. So, here we go. This one comes from Vitaly Skordivesky. Sorry if I uh, messed up your name, it's very hard. 
Uh, he's a tech support, a student in tech support. His question is, in what area should the U.S. invest more, education or small business? It's different. What we should do is to take steps to alleviate the home mortgage issues that are still unresolved so that banks will invest in small business and we can activate the Small Business Administration programs which have been up in the last two years, but which can only work if there's also private capital available because small business, except in emergency, basically the Small Business Administration just guarantees the loans that come from private banks. We should continue to invest in education, but it's important to invest in the right kinds of things. We should, we need to develop a more affordable model of higher education and ways to make sure that students can pay back all the debt they have as a percentage of their income so nobody ever has to drop out again and nobody ever has to pick a job because of their student loans. I'd like for the student loan repayments to be determined by the job you decide to take instead of having the job you take determined by the student loan payment. And there's evidence that it pays better. All right, our second question comes from Balthazar Montoya uh, for his U.S. history class at Escosa High School. If you, were found, if you found yourself in the White House again, would you change any of your policies or stances on issues that you had felt strongly about dur during your two terms as president? In general, any policies? Um, well, in general, no, what I would do is I, there are things I failed to do that I would like to do. I wish I could have made a peace in the Middle East. We were very, very close to it. And I wish that we had passed a uh, health care reform bill in 94, even if it was different than the one I wanted. For this reason, we, we got to realize, as I said, this is a big competitive issue. We, most Americans don't have any idea how much health care costs because they get health care at work and they pay about 25% of the cost. But this is killing us economically, and it's one big reason that people have gone 10 years without a pay raise because their employers are spending what would have been their pay raise on rising health care premiums. So I wish I had been more persuasive. But here's something I'd like you to think about, whatever your political party is. If you get a real controversial issue, it's going to take 60 votes in the U.S. Senate to pass, not 51. That is the only bill that can get all the way through Congress with a simple majority, whether you've got a Republican or a Democratic Congress, a Republican or a Democratic President, is the budget. Every other bill can be filibustered in the Senate, which means you have to have 60 out of 100 senators pass it. On the other hand, once any bill is passed on a big subject, then the impetus to filibuster is less than the impetus to fix what's wrong with it. So you know what the first bill passed on health care after the health care bill passed was? A bill to simplify the small business reporting requirements because the first bill messed it up and it was too complicated. And there was this overwhelming bipartisan support for this bill to simplify the small business reporting requirements. So if I could do it again, I would try to find a way to persuade Bob Dole, whom I thought we were going to, I offered to actually write a bill with Senator Dole. I put in my bill only after he declined to write a bill with me. I said, we'll just do it together. And more than any specific policy, I think that, I can tell you this, if I had it to do again, I would have sent 10,000 Americans with the UN force to Kigali, Rwanda, 60 days early than I did, and we'd have saved 300,000 lives in the Rwanda Delta. Uh, that's the most important thing. Um, but there are things I wish I could have done that I didn't. And if I had another shot at it, maybe I could, maybe I couldn't. But I think now I may have learned enough to be a little more persuasive.
I also wish I had succeeded in convincing the American people that it's not just the personalities of the leaders that matter. It's also the ideas they express and the things they promise to do. I know that a lot of you think all of us politicians are a bunch of slugs, but the truth is, all the historical evidence is that when a person runs for president and gets elected, he actually tries to do what he says he's going to do, unless it becomes manifestly dumb to do so. Like Franklin Roosevelt abandoned his promise to balance the budget in the Depression because he realized it would make the Depression worse. Abraham Lincoln abandoned his pledge never to free the slaves because he realized that keeping the Union would only be meaningful if he freed the slaves. But by and large, if you look at the history of American politics, you should pay closer attention to what President Obama and Governor Romney say in this campaign because they'll pretty much try to do what they say they're going to do. All right, WT, with that, would you please join me in giving a warm WT farewell to President Clinton.